Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, this is the seventh Sunday of the season of Easter, which means it's the last Sunday of the season of Easter, and then we transition into Pentecost, another good stuff. But, um, you know, it kind of has me thinking, maybe, maybe you won't get this right away, but uh, you ever been in a situation where you're with friends or family and you you feel like doing something, but you don't know what. You say, well, let's, let's, wh what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? <laughs> and maybe it goes around and around like that for a while. Um, or sometimes we feel that way even about others or even about God. God, what, what, what do you want to do? What are you doing, God? Uh, give us some clues. Give us some hints. Sometimes we can feel a little bit away from God's presence or his leading. And certainly some of Jesus' own followers, his own disciples, went through those kinds of times as well, wondering what's, what's God up to, what's happening next as we get to this end of the Easter season. So we'll talk more about that during our worship today. Uh, we're not going to just ask the questions, though. We're going we're to find his answers. We're going to dig into God's word and see his answers there. But let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Not yet. Uh, but let's uh, remember what God wants us to do uh, as far as what we say in our mission statement. And so if you'll say this with me. Grace exists to strengthen people in their relationship with Jesus Christ and to empower them to share Jesus with others. All right, now we prepare our hearts and minds with our first hymn. <laughs> As you're able to, I now invite you to stand for our words of invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Gathered here today, we remember that at one time Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The name you gave me, so that they may be. The ascended Lord Jesus be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are ascended into heaven, exalted far above every power and dominion. We know that our earthly praise cannot exalt you any higher than the position you already have at the right hand of the Father. And yet you make it clear that you delight in our prayers and praises. Accept our humble thanks for giving us the privilege again today of being part of your body, the church, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A series of readings for this, the seventh Sunday of Easter, beginning with the book of Acts in chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through, the, through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry with the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field, in their language, Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of the Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time. The Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to let uh, Ken come up here. Are you playing? Yeah, here he is. While he's coming up, uh, while you're sitting up, Ken, we're going to do portions of Psalm 47 responsibly. God has ascended amidst shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of the trumpets. Clap your hands, shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. He chose our inheritance for us. Sing praises to God, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King of the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord is the sound of the Ken? Good morning. Pardon my morning prayers. I ask that the Lord doesn't let me be a blessing to people that are trying to see him and hear him and read him. Let that have a positive impact.
Our second reading is taken from the epistle of 1 John in the fifth chapter. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to honor God's holy gospel. is risen. He is risen indeed. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory. Jesus said, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them, and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We join in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in, and in earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. In April, you're going to invite the kids up to join you, I believe, right? Yes. If they're in here, yes. <laughs> You're all right, Zayden. We can hang out. It's fine. It is. You can even come sit up here. You want to come sit up here? So I have a question for you. Do you ever tell stories? Like any kind of story. Not a lie, but like a story. Yeah, do you like to tell stories? What do you like about telling stories? Mm. 
Do you like to make people laugh? Yeah. Yes, you do. Me too. It's fun to see people happy, right? Yeah. So, we've been talking about a lot of things, right? We celebrated Easter, yeah. okay? And we know Jesus died, and we know he rose again, okay? And then we know he went up into heaven, okay? But the question is, what happened after that? Because the disciples were with him all the time, remember? And then what happened? Now what do they do? I'll give you a hint. What, what do we do? What are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to listen to God, and we're supposed to share, right? So we all like to tell stories. I think everyone in this room probably likes to tell stories, okay? That's how we share things. That's how we pass things along so that other people know what happens in our life. And some stories are really, really good. And I have this story, and it's actually called The Story. And what do you think it's about? Mm, about it is about Jesus. This is all about Jesus and what happened in his life and in our life. And so it's really exciting because as much as we love stories and the things that have happened to us, there is a story, or the story in this case, that is the most important story. And sometimes we forget to tell it. Do you ever forget to tell it? Mm, yeah. Me too. It happens sometimes. But what's really important is, even though our stories are great, right, and we can make people laugh and all of those things, but did you know Jesus can do something and make them feel things that we never can? And that's why it's so important that we share the story and not just our story. A lot of times you'll hear people say, well, tell them what Jesus did for you. We've heard that, right? They can all agree. We've all heard that, right? But what's more important is, what did Jesus do for everybody? Um, dying the death of those who are sinning. Yes, he did. He paid for our sins on the cross, and what else did he do? Dying to rose again. He did. And who else did he defeat? Do you remember? Who did he battle and he beat him? Do you remember? Um, mm -hmm. The he Satan. He did. He defeated him and sin because he knew we couldn't do it. We could never do it by ourselves. And that's why when we tell our stories about what Jesus did in our life, that's amazing. And we should because it's an example. But we have to do one more thing after that. And we have to tell them why it's so important. Because, yeah, it makes us feel good and we get nice things and we're successful and we're happy. But there's a reason he does that for us, because he loves us so much that he wants us to be taken care of forever, not just while we're here. Because where do we get to go once we're done living on earth? To heaven. To heaven, that's right. And then we get to live there forever. So that is the most important story. So next time you share a story, because you're going to tell one, right? Yes. <laughs> Me too. So the next time you tell one, you think you could take it one step after that and tell them why it's so important? You think you could do that? Yeah, I think you can too, Hata. We can do that. All right, so you want to pray with me, and then I've got something for you. Okay, you ready? Thank you for giving us a story that is real. By sending your son, Jesus, help us to always tell his story of his love for everybody. In your name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Okay, I got a treat for you.
Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Between the now and the not yet. Between the now and the not yet. That's a phrase maybe you hear from time to time, and certainly it's one that fits for us today. But there are all kinds of situations in life and in faith where we might find ourselves in that kind of a situation where we are between the now and the not yet. Something not quite done, almost there, but not yet. Sometimes those are anxious moments. Other times they're kind of exciting moments. Let's say, for example, you're doing one of my favorite acti activities. You're baking cookies. You've got a batch of cookies on a tray. You put them in the oven. The recipe says you bake them for about 15 minutes. Now we're about 10, 11, 12 minutes in, and you know what's going on, right? The, there's an aroma that begins to fill the kitchen more and more, and it's a lovely aroma. But as much as you really enjoy the aroma of those baking chocolate chip cookies, what you want even more than to smell them is to eat them, right? But you know, you still got to wait a little while. If you take them out of the oven now, it's too early. It's just a gooey, globby mess. And so you're for a while, just a moment anyway, kind of caught between the now and the not yet. It's not a bad thing necessarily. It's filled with that anticipation, that expectation. But sometimes it's not always like that. You see, here we are on this seventh Sunday of this season of Easter, which means that we just celebrated the ascension of Jesus a few days ago. We know from the Bible that Jesus ascended bodily into heaven the 40th day of his resurrection. So counting Easter day as day one, you count out 40 days, you end up with that on last Thursday, May 13th. That was ascension day. And if you keep on counting just a few more days, just one more week's worth of days, you'll get to day 50, and that's when we celebrate Pentecost. The coming of the Holy Spirit with great power and, and signs. So, again, day 40, Jesus ascends and goes away. The Holy Spirit doesn't show up until day 50, Pentecost Day. In other words, we are right at this very moment between the now and the not yet. Between the time when Jesus' work of salvation is complete, it's all done, and yet the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, hasn't quite happened, at least not for the disciples. And so i got to believe for these 10 days, for this little window of time between the now and the not yet, this was, this was sort of an anxious time for the disciples. I imagine that, that they weren't really quite sure what was going on or even quite what to do. Their Savior, their friend, their teacher, their Lord, He's gone up into heaven. They saw him go. And they've also heard him say, wait for the Holy Spirit to come, but that hasn't happened yet. Well, Ben, what now? Is everything over? Is, is, is everything that they're supposed to be doing, is it done or is there more to come? It's hard to say. It's always hard to say when you're in that awkward little moment between the now and the not yet. And I bet every one of us, I bet every single one of us can understand that to some degree or another. I bet all of us at some time or another have been through moments, maybe through entire seasons of life, where we weren't quite sure. Maybe we weren't quite sure what God was up to. Where was he leading us? What direction was he taking us? You ever felt like that? You ever felt that kind of thing where not only did it not seem like Jesus was active in your life, but you yourself just didn't feel very spiritual. Where, where, where you know, Jesus was kind of gone, the Holy Spirit hadn't really shown up in your life at that particular time, between the now and the not yet. Well, it is during times like that, whatever they are for you, but it's during times like that we, we need to remember something, something that the Bible teaches that is encapsulated by something that we say. In fact, something we just said a few moments ago in the Apostles' Creed. Those three little phrases that come right smack in the middle of the creed. 
he ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, and he'll come again to judge the living and the dead, the, the past, the present, and the future. But I wonder what you picture in your mind when you say those words or when you have us talking about it even right now. What does that look like in your imagination? Now, the, he ascended into heaven. That's kind of easy, I suppose, because we've all seen artist renditions of maybe what that kind of would have looked like. Jesus, you know, floating up into the air, up into the clouds, the disciples kind of looking like all surprised and everything like that. So we've seen that. We can picture that one. And, and the future one, he will come again. Maybe that's not quite as easy since it hasn't happened yet, but we can maybe, well, if you can picture him going up into heaven, you can just reverse the film, have him coming back down, because that's what the angel said. You'll key, see him come back the same way you saw him go, so maybe we can get that one. But what about between the two? Between the now and the not yet? What about, what about at this very moment? Because what we say in the creed is that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. How do you picture that one? I've never seen an artist's rendition of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Maybe it exists, but what do you picture? I mean, maybe, maybe like me, you kind of picture this, uh, the Lincoln Memorial scene. You know, you've seen pictures or you've been to the Lincoln Memorial. There's Lincoln sitting on that really uncomfortable looking chair. <laughs> as, as, just as, as, as motionless as stone, well, because he is, you know. And, and it's sort of that sad, serious face of his. Is, is that how we picture Jesus? Is that what he's doing, sitting at the right hand of the Father? Kind of like nothing. I mean, it sounds really, really dull, doesn't it? But no, that's not what we're saying. And certainly that's not the picture the Bible paints for us. The Bible tells us that Jesus... Jesus is active. Jesus is extremely active as he sits at the Father's right hand. Okay, well, what is he doing? Well, Jesus told his disciples before he ascended exactly what he would be doing. He told them, I go and prepare a place for you. I go and prepare a place for you. Well, okay, well, how does this fit? I mean, how exactly is Jesus preparing a place for you and all of us and all the other believers? How is he preparing a place for us if all he is doing is sitting? Well, because what he is doing is not just sitting. Jesus is very actively preparing a place by doing exactly what the Bible says. He is praying for you. Well, the other word that we sometimes use, it's another biblical word, is he is interceding for you. For example, this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 7. Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he lives to always intercede for them. Let me read that one more time. That's Hebrews 7, 24. Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he lives in heaven, of course, resurrected. He lives to always intercede for them. In other words, he is speaking on your behalf. And that's a, that's a full-time job. He is speaking up for us much in the same way that you might imagine, say, a lawyer speaking up for you in front of a judge. Okay? The, the, this is the picture that, that, the, that we're supposed to kind of get in our brains with this. I mean, the Roman lawyer system and all that was a little bit different, but still a lot of it's the same. We're in a courtroom setting. We're in a courtroom setting. You are on trial, and Jesus is interceding for you. He is pleading your case before the Father's throne. And the accuser, the prosecuting attorney, is the devil himself. And he's got a whole list of charges against you. Just on and on it goes. He's got multiple counts of sins in, in thought, sins of speech, sins of action, as well as sins of lack of action. And not just that, but the prosecuting attorney, the accuser, is, always, is also going to point out your apparent 
inability to steer clear of this stuff, to, to almost seem to not really have a sincere desire to want to be rid of your sins. And that's a deal breaker. That is the deal breaker, right? You see, God only allows perfect people into heaven. That is it. Only perfect people are allowed in God's presence in heaven, and you, my friend, are not perfect. You're, 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 you're unworthy. You're guilty, right? And, and, and the guilty, in God's courtroom, the guilty are sentenced. There's only one sentence, and it's death. And not just regular death. This is like permanent death. Eternity apart from God. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that's it. The devil knows you're guilty. You know you're guilty. And worst of all, God the Father, the judge, he knows you're guilty. Nevertheless, the Father asks you if you have anything to say in your defense. You could answer in quite a few different ways here. There's lots of potential ways to respond. You could say that, well, yes, you know that you're not perfect, but really, really you have tried hard. You have you had a whole lot of good, really good intentions. Okay. But that doesn't mean you're not guilty. You could say that you have lived better than most people, and you've got plenty of people who will tell you, who, 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 who will give you that, that, that credit, and who will tell about your righteousness and your high level of integrity and everything that you do, and people will attest to that. Okay. But that doesn't mean you're not guilty. You might say that really you were just dealt a bad hand in life. You had all kinds of you know, bad influences, your culture, your neighborhood, rough childhood, whatever it is, but none of it, none of it changes the bottom line. The bottom line is that you're still guilty. You have no defense. This is, this is a slam dunk. But even though you have no defense, you do have a really good lawyer. It is none other than Jesus himself who intercedes for you. He speaks up on your behalf. He speaks up not offering excuses, not being open to a plea deal. Instead, he offers himself. He lets it be known that even though, yes, you're guilty, clearly, but he has already paid the price for your punishment. This, everything that your sin deserves, he has already been through. He has, he has been through death, been through hell for you, and have come out of it alive. Which means that all your sin is accounted for. It means that the punishment has all been paid. It means, listen carefully, it means that heaven is prepared for you. Heaven is prepared for you. Heaven is prepared because Jesus intercedes for you. He takes your place. And so this whole thing about interceding, Jesus already shows his disciples a little bit of, uh, of what that means right there in John 17 that we read a little while ago. Jesus is praying out loud in front of his disciples for his disciples. And here's the best part. That is that in the same way that Jesus prayed for his disciples, he prays for you too. And, and what does Jesus pray for on your behalf? Well, based on the prayer that he prays in John 17, certainly he prays for your protection. I mean, Jesus knew for his own disciples that the cost of being one of his followers in those early days would have a high cost attached to it. He knew that there would be danger. He knew that out of the original 12 disciples, one would betray him. Ten of the 12 would be put to death just for speaking his name. He knew that there would be times where they would get very discouraged and afraid and tempted to run, tempted to just avoid the pain, escape the danger. And so Jesus prays for them. But please notice how he prays. Please notice that he does not pray for there to be less danger. He doesn't pray for them to have fewer problems 
or to avoid hardship or to get past the, the you know, be, not have any tears or pain or sorrow. Instead, what does he pray for? He prays for their protection. He prays for them to be strong exactly because he knows those things will be part of their experience. He doesn't pray for their escape, but for their victory. And so Jesus prays to the Heavenly Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. What an important message for any of us personally, and, and what an important message for us as a congregation. We, Grace Lutheran Church, we're not simply a collection of individuals that just happen to show up at a certain time in a certain place. No, we are the body of Christ. And as a body, it's vitally important that we are united, that we work together. We're not here because we want what we want. We're here because we want what God wants. And we want to God want what God wants. We're not a random gathering of people, but people whom God gathers in this exact time, in this exact place, with this exact mix of skills and gifts and backgrounds brought together to pursue his mission, to achieve his purpose for us. And here again, Jesus not only prayed that for his original disciples, he prays it for us too. Right now, in the very courts of heaven, this is Jesus' prayer for us. Jesus knew that there are so many things that can disrupt unity in any congregation, in any church. Jesus knows that, that it's not always easy to maintain unity with groups of sinful, fallen people. He also knew, however, that we can never accomplish the things that he has called on us to accomplish if we don't work together. At times, the devil tempts us to stand nose to nose in conflict. At times, the devil tempts us to stand back to back, just ignoring things. But God calls on us to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand. Not a crowd, but a congregation. I once heard a story about a church somewhere here in Texas, a little country church somewhere that was planning to build a new sanctuary. Of course, you know, at the beginning of a, a building project, typically there's some sort of formal ceremonial beginning, usually a groundbreaking ceremony, right? Some special turning over of the dirt and everything begins. And Well, this particular church, when they had their groundbreaking ceremony, they decided they wanted to do it a little bit differently, a little bit more unique for them, not just a shovel of dirt, but they thought it'd be pretty cool since they were this country rural church. They would bring in an old plow, an old single blade plow, the kind that gets pulled by a horse or something like that. And so uh, they brought in this, uh, this old plow and they got a couple of the biggest, strongest young men of the congregation to kind of get into the harness of this thing and then, and, then, and then to pull it. But it hadn't rained in a long time. The ground was as hard as concrete and so it, it, the plow wouldn't budge. But they were prepared for such an eventuality. They brought out this rope. They attached another rope to the front of the plow. So besides the, the two young men, they had a few other guys grab onto this rope and pull on the thing and still wouldn't budge. Well, finally, they asked everybody who was there, young or old, male, female, whatever it was, just everybody there to, to take a hold of that rope somewhere, somehow. And then... With every member pulling together, the plow finally moved and the ground was broken. Now, the moral of the story is pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, churches tend not to be truly effective until and unless everyone works together for that one job that Jesus gives to his church of all time and of all places. I mean, the way we have come to phrase it for ourselves, we're doing it at the start of every service, to strengthen people in their relationship with Jesus Christ, to empower them to share Jesus with others. And that's a tall order. We realize that. That's, that's a big job. And sometimes the ground is, it, it can be tough, and the growing, going can be pretty rough. So, sure, there's work to do. But we know we have all the gifts and skills and abilities to do it. That's why we did the thing just a couple of weeks ago with our gifts inventory. That's why you see the back of the church, the, the pages with the, with the dots that represent where we have our skills and abilities. And yet the point is that working together 
pulling as one by God's design, pursuing God's will. There's no limit to what we can do. So, like the disciples, during those ten kind of awkward days between Jesus' ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that sort of not sure what was going to happen yet, what was going to go on next, there are times in life, and there are times in the lives of churches, that we might feel something like that. Not quite sure yet what God has in mind. Sort of stuck, sort of in this now and not yet way. Certainly we can look back and we can see how God has blessed us. That's why the timeline in the hall, like to, to remind us of so many of those things. And then there's certainly more to come. God, God we, we know he's got more things in mind for us. What about the in-between? Is there anything that we can know for sure about this moment? This now but not yet place? And the answer is yes. Very much so, yes. I mean, you can be sure that Jesus, even now, ascended in glory, sitting at the right hand of the Father, he's not twiddling his thumbs. He's not just waiting for someone to tell him, oh, time to go now. <laughs> no, he is doing the most active thing he can. He's interceding for you. He is actively, continually praying that you will be protected from spiritual danger, protected and united to his church as we encourage each other in faith, encourage one another to, to reach out to others with the good news. And, and, and he is praying that we do it working together, that we live out our faith not only by encouraging each other, but also by, 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 by making relationships with those who don't really know Jesus yet, taking seriously his command to make disciples of all nations, pointing them to the cross as well. And so just as Jesus is now active for us, may we remain active this side of heaven for him. This time between the now and the not yet. As it says in 1 John 3, verse 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known but we know that when Christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is thanks be to God amen I invite you to stand we come together today as the people of God in this place we are one together in the Lord yet often we let our pettiness and personal opinions divide us and fracture the unity God has created in his son as those who bear the name of the triune God given to us in our baptism, let us confess our sins to God and implore him for his forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, to whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hid, we confess to you that we are often disobedient children who desire our own will instead of seeking to accomplish your will in our lives. You have gathered us together as one people in your church, and yet often our attitudes fail to reflect the unity we have in Christ. Forgive us our sin of self-centeredness and enable us to see the world as you do, filled with people who need to know the grace and forgiveness of Christ Jesus our, our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, be assured that God, who unites us with himself through the blood of the cross, here's our confession. God promises that even as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and forgives us for the sake of Jesus. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of the word, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to joy, shout to joy.
completely and always appropriate, as well as our sacred duty to give all thanks and praise to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to all his disciples and in their sight was taken up into heaven, that he might make us partakers of his divine life. Grant us faithfully to eat and drink this holy supper, trusting our reigning Savior Jesus, who, though unseen in his ascended glory, is here present to save us by his body and blood. Amen. The now and the not yet for us today. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. <laughs> serving our Lord's Supper in our usual way. You'll be ushered up by the center aisle, returning by the side aisles. When you receive the elements, you can either commune yourself here at the railing or take it back to your pew. Also, for those of you who request it, we will have uh, alternatives, gluten-free hosts, alcohol-free wine. You can just indicate that when you come forward. Also, if you're not being communed today, you're still welcome to come forward to receive a blessing. Just indicate that to me when you uh, approach with your hands folded across your shoulders. We also have the offering plates up here for those of you who brought an offering to leave today. The supper is served.
Now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare to go to God's throne of grace in prayer today, some prayer requests to share with you uh, for Mary Beth, been diagnosed with uh, basal cell skin cancer, and be treated for that. For uh, a prayer of thanksgiving for a successful heart surgery on Susie's infant great-granddaughter. Thanksgiving, Jonathan, I'm not sure if I get the right last name right, uh, recovering quickly, uh, recovering quietly from COVID. For uh, continual heating for Anita, Anita Cooper, recovering from her leg surgery last week. Uh, also a request for a, a friend who had a seizure leading to her hospitalization and a co-worker's brother suffering from a brain injury after a motorcycle accident. And a request for Austin while he spends the next 10 weeks in Barcelona in his studies abroad. For all these things, we go to God in prayer. Lord God, we live during a time between the now and the not yet. Jesus has died for our sins and risen from the grave. But while that makes us yours already now, we are not experiencing all the joys of heaven yet. We are more now than what we were before you saved us, but we are not yet everything we will be in your heavenly presence. But just as you are active on our behalf in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, so show us how to be active also, actively living our faith, bearing fruit, and interceding in prayer for others, just as Jesus intercedes for us, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayers of need for those we know who need a special hand of comfort, healing, wholeness. We pray for Austin and Mary Beth, for uh, Anita, and for uh, prayers of thanks for Susie's infant granddaughter, for Jonathan, and for all those that now we name before you in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in each of these situations, as with everything, you know what is needed, and we pray, Lord, that you grant the wholeness that is being sought, giving them strength in both body and soul according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we also pray with great thanksgiving on behalf of those we know who have special reasons to celebrate this week for the baptismal birthdays of Victoria Pappas and Emmett Snodgrass, William Darwin, Christy Frauiger, the birthdays of Taylor Haddock, Gina Parsons, Lyndall Davis, and the wedding anniversaries of Brian and Brenda Hanchi, Clark and Freda Crabtree. Lord, for these and for every one of us, may we see all the great things you do for us in life, that every blessing comes from your hand and make us grateful for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for places around the world where there is unrest, especially right now in the Middle East. Lord, we pray that peace would yet become, come about, that the bombings and shootings would stop and there'd be more opportunities to bring the gospel into those parts of the world that have yet to know you. We ask, Lord, that you bring peace to us as well, that you give our leaders, whether federal, state, or local, uh, wisdom and integrity as they carry out their duties. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for your church everywhere around the world, but especially here at Grace. Help us, Lord, to make better and more consistent use of your word of truth. Enlighten our hearts that we may reflect the joy of our salvation openly. Give us courage in every situation to acknowledge that we belong to you so that we might strengthen the weak and bring hope to the hopeless. And when at last we have fulfilled your purposes in our lives, take us to your ascension throne, where we may share in your glory forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. 
Amen. Seated. it. I hear the rain outside, so you don't want to go out yet. So as long as you're here, we'll just have a minute or two to uh, catch up on some things, some announcements. Uh, first of all, the uh, Family Promises Week is coming up. Week of May 30th through June 5, looking for help, hosts and helpers. And Robin, you're the one to see about that. Do you want to go ahead and say some more? Go ahead. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. All right. Uh, church picnic, two weeks from today, May 30th. So that'll be, it won't be raining then, but it'll be uh, outside. You, you, you don't think I know, do you? Okay. <laughs> In the pavilion, go back to that one real quick. Uh, 1030, so the one service, 1030, pavilion, followed by the picnic, food and fun and fellowship. You can't beat it. So, all right. Hey, the next one, summer schedule. Go back to the picnic. Go, April wants to go back to the picnic.
Excellent. Thank you. Summer schedule, so the following week, so all through June, July, and August, we're expecting to follow the schedule, which has the one service at 9.15, so we have a couple weeks till we get there, but the 9.15 service, 10.30 a.m. Sunday school hour. Uh, yes, man looks at outward appearance, the God looks at the heart. Very good. Uh, speaking of uh, who you're speaking of, Amy, good job. Thank you with the bell, choir. Amy, you did. Yeah. Um, we, we already clapped for you, Ken, so I was just going to make it fair. <laughs> God's getting the applause either way, right? Um, a- anything else from anybody? Elders, good. All right. Hey, s- last Sunday of the uh, Easter season, not that it ever stops being true, but this is our last time to do it on purpose like this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.